Our scripture reading for this morning's sermon is taken from Colossians, and if you would turn with me to Colossians chapter 1, we're going to begin reading with some select verses there, and uh, then into our focus of chapter 3. Before we read, let's ask God for let's ask God for his blessing upon the word. Our Father in heaven, we gather this morning and we do so to be with you and to hear from you. We remember that you once spoke in the beginning in the word of creation. We remember that you continued to speak in the promise and further revealing of your covenant of grace from the old covenant and then preeminently through the new covenant of Jesus Christ. Oh, how we thank you, Father, for coming to us, for we could never come to you. Thank you for speaking to us, for how could we speak to you? Thank you for now ministering to us your word, and we pray that as it's read and as it's preached, it would come with your blessing. May the Holy Spirit now do the work that only you can do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Colossians chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. This is God's word. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that, that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Now pause there and turn with me um, to chapter 2, verse 1. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all those who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and of the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures and wisdom, all the treasures and wisdom and knowledge of God. Again, pause and turn with me to chapter 3, verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Finally, then, we move to verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. And fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bondservants, or, as I'll read further, do loss, do loss, obey in everything those who are your earthly curios. The Greek for bondservant is do loss. The Greek for uh, master is curios. So again, verse 22, do loss, obey in everything those who are your curios, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Curios, treat your doulos justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. 
So far, the reading of God's word. Please be seated. Well, beloved congregation, I hope that you agree with me that so far in our study of Colossians, we've come to Colossians 3, uh, a passage that may be one of the most wonderful of the book. In fact, from, in my opinion, uh, Colossians 3 may be one of the most wonderful in all the Bible. It truly is wonderful. It is full of wonder. And so maybe it shouldn't surprise us if some of that wonderfulness is a bit difficult to understand. And that's why we've taken our time to study each part, how each word and phrase and verse relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ. For example, over the past few weeks, we've heard how the the word of Christ, the word of Christ in the gospel is at work in all things. Along the way, to help us understand that more clearly, we've identified a number of assumptions within the text, haven't we? How the Holy Spirit has been developing the, the previous word, the previous revelation of God, the word of God and creation, the word of God throughout the old covenant into this preeminence of Jesus Christ and the church this preeminence of Christ in marriage, this preeminence of Christ in parenting. And now this morning we hear about this preeminence of Christ in the workplace or this word of Christ, the active word of Christ within the workplace. I don't know about you, but I think this vision of Christ in all things Uh, is difficult to see. And I think one of the reasons for that, one of the reasons it's difficult to see that and understand it in our text is because it is clouded by statements of submission and not uh, not the most popular of ideas today. Statements of wives submitting to husbands and children obeying parents. And then in our text, the doulos submitting to the kurios especially when we note that the doulos has often been translated as slaves and the kurios often translated as masters. We stumble over statements like that and we, we stumble because those things are often abused. Even the good gifts that God has given so often abused. And so let's be clear this morning. Let's just state it in black and white that abusive, dehumanizing relationships are evil. Wherever they may be found, abusive, dehumanizing relationships are not merely sinful, They are willful acts of evil, whether they be found at home or at work or anywhere. Now, there's a number of reasons we need to be clear about that. But but one of the, the more prominent reasons for this morning is that if we're not clear about that, we're going to lose sight of God and the gospel in our passage. And that's not good. Because none of this makes sense apart from God, apart from the Word of God and the Gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's remember again how Colossians begins with this celebration of God, this wonderful thanksgiving of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And let's remember how it continues into this this crescendo of the preeminence of Christ in and over all things. How chapter 3 comes to speak about the word of Christ and its enriching power. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly so that whatever you do in word or deed, you would have the grace to live 
with thanksgiving for the great salvation that he has secured. That's what brings us into our text, isn't it? This, this cultivation of God and the gospel, this development of Jesus' death, and particularly Jesus' glorious resurrection, bringing application to the church, bringing application to marriage, to wives and husbands, to parenting, to children, even to this doulos and curios relationship, this doulos curios relationship, this this servant master dynamic, and if if remembering that that kind of let's say logic and development of the text isn't enough, the apostle, the Holy Spirit here comes and he he helps us to remember each step along the way. Church, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Wives, in the Lord. Husbands, in the Lord. Children, in the Lord. And likewise, this call to work in the Lord. And what we're finding then is just as the word of God brought order to creation in Genesis 1, so here the word of Christ is bringing order to the new creation, inaugurated in the resurrection of Jesus, begun there at the empty grave, and now continued through the church, church, marriage, parenting, families, and the doulos, curios relationship. That's where we're going. But first, we've got to deal with a problem. And and everybody who reads this text bumps into the problem. We might call it a particular issue that just doesn't go away. It's an issue that makes understanding this passage particularly difficult. And so what is it? What is the problem? Or what is the issue? And most Christians, including myself on probably most occasions, would attribute it to an issue of translation, an issue of translation. So, for example, in our text, Colossians 3, verse 22 and following, there is this reference to a doulos and to a curios. And the reason I've been emphasizing the Greek words is because the range of meaning in those words is relatively broad. For example... The doulos uh, can uh, be translated uh, from anything from a, a slave of the worst kind known to history. It can be translated as, as, a, as a servant. We might think of as a household servant or even what would have been known then as an ordinary employee. We're going to come back to that in a moment. Do loss is hard to, to uh, na- n- uh, narrow down. It's likewise, curios, um, translated in your Bibles, I think, as master, oftentimes translated Lord. And so there are these translation issues that make understanding and appreciating the text uh, very difficult. But, but actually, as we'll see in a moment, the, the vision being cast here uh, is, is, is really not about the continuation of slavery or anything like that. However you would define it, that's not, that is not what the apostle is aiming at. That's not what the Holy Spirit is revealing to us. Rather, what is being, what is being set forth to us is a vision of Christ in the workplace. The fundamental issue here is submission. The fundamental issue is submission. Just as it is teased out in the marriage relationship, the parental relationship, before that the church relationship, now it is the workplace relationship. The fundamental issue is understanding our call 
to submit to authority. Submission to the authority structures that God has established and that have been grievously broken by sin. What Christ is doing here is calling all Christians to submit and to serve within the office that he has established. Jesus is calling all Christians to know and to submit to the the responsibilities that he has given to them, to you and to me. We're going to explain this a little bit more in a few minutes, but for now, just notice this, that the doulos is called to obey or to serve or to submit to the curios, doing so in the Lord, in the Lord. In the Lord. In the Lord. The doulos is called to live out his or her office and responsibility in life in the Lord. Four times it is emphasized that this is in the Lord. So whether the doulos, you see, it's not so much a matter of translation now, is it? Because whether the doulos is a hired employee, a household servant, or bound to the worst kind of slavery. What Jesus is saying is that you belong to me. You don't belong to yourself. You don't belong to them or that group. You belong to me. You are a son of the king. Whatever status in life, you, Christian, are a daughter of the king. So how do we see this? How do we see this? Well, in past weeks, we've noticed that many teachers come to uh, these verses, uh, how they speak to marriage and parenting and the doulos curious relationship, and many teachers will assume that the Apostle Paul is writing about common cultural uh, practices of that time and place. And so with that view and that approach to the text, what is said about marriage, parenting, and the family is not necessarily true today. It may have been true then, but it's not necessarily true today because we're in a different time and place and cultural patterns. You see, the problem with that, the problem with that, let me see if I can make it clear as we have been going through Colossians together, what we've noticed is that the book, if not every verse, certainly every paragraph and chapter of Colossians makes it clear that the fundamental assumption or presupposition, if you will, is not or was not the cultural practices of the day, but rather what God had spoken in the beginning. The fundamental presupposition and assumption of Colossians is the word of God in creation, the word of God throughout the old covenant, and how all of that comes to us in Christ. As chapter 3, verse 16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And so we're not going to take time this morning to unpack or restate all of those assumptions from previous weeks, but Simply remember that all of that continues on here. The word, of Christ, the word of God formally spoken, now the word of Christ coming in fulfillment, with enrichment to our life within the church enrichment for our lives within marriage, the word of Christ for enrichment of our parent-child relationship, and now the word of Christ, the, the gospel, enriching the workplace of, of verses 22 and following. Now before we unpack that, we need to be especially clear of one further assumption 
Uh, again, not restating the assumptions related to marriage and parenting and family and so on, but, but the additional assumption that's specific to our verses, namely this, that God did not establish, God did not establish the, the doulos, curios relationship of master-servant. Rather, through creation and the created order, God established vocations. And the good relationships of the workplace. And so that before sin, work would have been an expression of joy. Before sin, work would have been the a sharing of various roles and responsibilities according to the gifts and abilities that individuals were given. We see this in Adam as uh, God calls Adam to grow and to guard the garden. Remember? He had a vocational calling. He had work to do. And he begins to exercise that work as he uh, names the animals, bringing God's good order into the broader expressions of life. But, kids, you know that sin and the curse of sin made a mess of this. Sin and the curse of sin brought struggle into humanity. Sin and the curse of sin brought struggle into the authority structures of the home. So that Genesis 3, verse 17, remember, it describes marriage as one of competing desires. Not the cultivation of a loving union and uh, an abounding of joy in the Lord, but now, because of sin and the curse of sin, marriage will be one of competing desires and competing authorities. And likewise, chapter 3, verse 18 goes on to describe work not as the, the abounding of joy in the Lord, but rather describes work as painful. Work without a sense of purpose. By the sweat of your face you shall eat till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Before sin, vocation, work, an abounding of joy for the greater glory of God, after sin, pain, toil, vanity, the sense of purposelessness. So what do we find then here? But God acting in the beginning to establish the good of marriage, not divorce. God acting in the beginning to establish the good of work, not the master-servant thing that has become so common in history, not slavery. In fact, we don't hear about servitude or slavery until Genesis 9, verse 25 as God responds to the sin of Canaan now, saying, Cursed be Canaan. He shall be a servant of servants. You could translate that, tra translate that. He shall be a slave of the slaves. And so, again, what we have in our passage of Colossians is, is this profoundly important assumption or presupposition that God has acted to establish vocation and work to be the abundance of joy in him. But sin and the curse of sin has brought it to be the greatest of burdens. This makes a huge difference then in how we understand our tax, doesn't it? makes a huge difference in how we understand our text. Not playing with cultural patterns of that time and place or other things of history, but rather developing what God has spoken and bringing that to bear upon us in Christ. 
So it's, it's flat out wrong to come to Colossians 3 and somehow justify a strict master-servant relationship, much less to come here and somehow justify the practice and evils of slavery. So what is happening? The Word of Christ. The Word of Christ is living and active here. Jesus is speaking to the church of how his gospel is changing our work. When the gospel is applied to work, you see, it is transformed from the curse it has begun uh, and into the joy it was always designed to be. That takes time. Just as Christian marriage and Christian parenting and Christian churches take time, so also this, this Christian calling within vocational responsibilities in the workplace takes time. But Jesus is patient. He's spoken then and he continues speaking today. That he wants us to be a part of making our vocational calling and workplace environment to be an expression of him and the gospel. You see, that's true for the doulos and the curios. That's true whether you be the Christian doulos or if you are the Christian curios. Remember, and here if you're taking notes, we're at uh, the third point. You see the blanks there for doulos, curios. Remember the range of meaning there. A doulos could be a slave, the worst kind of slave, where one person literally owns the life of another person. That could be a doulos. It could also be translated bond servant, or what we would think of as a, a household servant. If we try to contemporize this a little bit, we could translate that, probably paraphrase that as an employee. And I would encourage you to do that. Write in your notes that a doulos you could think of as a kind of employee. Likewise, the curios. There's a range of meaning for the curios. It could, it could uh, be translated Lord. And in fact, in this passage is used to refer to the Lord Jesus himself. Curios. Sometimes translated master. It could refer to the sweetness of Christ. It could refer to the worst kind of slave owner. It could also be paraphrased as an employer. And I would encourage you for our time and place to think in those terms. The doulos, curios relationship spoken to in our text is speaking into what we know to be an employee-employer relationship. And so what Jesus is saying is that wherever you find yourself in life, if you have authority or If you are under authority, Jesus says, fulfill your responsibilities in my name. In my name. To the doulos, he says in chapter 3, verse 22, obey in everything those who are your earthly curios not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. Again, let's be clear, this is not speaking to the extraordinary circumstances of violent, abusive, dehumanizing activities. Rather, what it is speaking to are the much more ordinary relationships of the workplace environment. And Jesus is saying that whatever your status then, work in the Lord and for the Lord and in fear of the Lord, knowing that he is with you and that he will reward you. You might even go further that Jesus is saying, your 
your curios, your employer, may not be worth such honor. I know, I understand. Don't do it for him, do it for me. And in doing it for me, you will be a blessing to him. And to the curios, Jesus says, treat your doulos justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Again, not speaking to the extraordinary times of violence and dehumanizing relationships, but the more ordinary relationship of the workplace environment. Jesus says to the curios, your employees may not be worth such honor, or maybe better to say your employees may not be worthy of such honor, but, but I am. I am. Don't do it for them as much as for me. And when you do it for me, Jesus says, you'll be a blessing to them. You'll be a blessing to them. If you think maybe your minister is stretching the text just a little bit, what's our usual practice? Scripture interprets Scripture, doesn't it? So we have Colossians and, and a parallel passage in Ephesians. But maybe something even more insightful for this morning is Philemon, the book of Philemon. Kids, you may remember the book of Philemon way towards the end of the Bible. It's so short. In fact, it only has one chapter. In Philemon, Paul is writing to uh, Philemon. And he's writing to Philemon about a man named Onesimus. Both are Christians. Philemon is a curios. Philemon is a Christian curios. Onesimus is a Christian doulos of Philemon's household. Onesimus is a Christian doulos of Philemon's household. And there is a serious problem, uh, not a matter of translation now in this case, um, but rather a serious issue of authority. You see, Onesimus abandon his office and his vocation. Onesimus ran away from Philemon and his household. And along the way, Onesimus, he meets Paul, and he's, he's discipled by the apostle Paul. And, and Paul explains that it wasn't right for Onesimus to abandon his work like that. And so what does Paul do? He sends Onesimus back to Philemon. He sends Onesimus back to his curios with this letter. Writing to Philemon, Receive Onesimus no longer as a doulos, but as a dear brother in Christ. In fact, let me read a word for word Philemon, beginning with verse 17. Paul writes, So, Philemon, if you consider me your partner, if you consider me your, a fellow minister in the Lord, a partner in the gospel, receive Onesimus as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. I will repay what Onesimus owes you. To say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. In the Lord, you see. I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. What a statement. What a statement into that time and place. And oh, how... How enriching is this word of the Lord for our time and place? Another pastor and teacher from the Gospel Coalition, thank you to Reverend File for sharing this with me, uh, another pastor and teacher explains it like this. What Paul is doing here is he's writing Philemon to dissolve the slave-master relationship, and he erects in its place a brother-brother relationship in which the former doulos is treated with all the dignity with which the apostle himself would be treated. 
And so think of it. Hundreds of years before the actual institution of slavery is abolished, the work of the gospel abolishes the assumptions and the prejudices that made slavery possible. You see, the word of Christ at work. The master who came to be, not to be served, but to serve. To be a doulos. Giving his life as a gift, a ransom for many. As it says in another place, he who knew no sin became sin. Took the status of the worst of the worst in order that sinners like you and me might become with him the very righteousness of God. Oh, congregation, imagine with that kind of Christ, uh, imagine what, what if the world was blessed with that kind of Christianity? In church, in marriage, in parenting, even at work. The gospel enriches the workplace as well. And other callings and responsibilities, I've experienced that. I've experienced working shoulder to shoulder with other Christians, Christian leaders, other Christian employees. I know you've experienced things like that too, and it is, it is sweet. It is special, something the world stands in awe of when done in the name and the word and in the wisdom of the Lord. What we hear this morning then is whether we would be an Esther, who of us would ever want to have our daughters fulfill the office of Esther? Whether we be an Esther or the church in Babylon, whether we be Onesimus or Christians in change, or whether we're just going through the daily grind in the workplace. Christian, you are a son. You are a daughter of the king. It starts here, doesn't it? It starts here. Let's pray it would grow. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the gift of your word spoken long ago and especially the fulfillment of your word in Christ. And we thank you now for the word of Christ and how you um, speak and, and act through that word even now. You see our hearts, oh Father, you know what we need and we pray that you would provide what you know to be best. Oh, how we plead with you for those in the those in those extraordinary circumstances and facing terrible violence, facing abuse, for peoples throughout the world today still facing enslavement. Oh, how we plead that you would do an extraordinary work to set them free. And for those in the more ordinary daily grind of life. May we be given the grace to rise above the pain we experience. May we be given the grace to rise above the purposelessness we perceive. And grant us the grace to see how Jesus is even now at work, whatever our status, wherever we may be, for the greater coming of his kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.